it's indeed my pleasure to welcome Professor Obhijit Tarukdar. Sir has been our teacher and sir is going to talk to us about the newer drugs that have come into the pipeline in the management of chronic kidney disease, prevention of progression of disease and a little bit about the newer guidelines as has been published by KDG. Sir, the screen is all yours. Thank you, uh, Professor Ghosh, and uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, uh, when we discuss about DKD management, diabetic kidney disease management, one should remember that DKD is not a homogeneous entity. Suppose a patient comes with diabetes, with early renal involvement, with microproteinuria, normal renal function, blood pressure almost normal or marginally elevated, management of such a patient and another patient who has advanced chronic kidney disease are not the same. <coughs> Excuse me. Moreover, we nephrologists hardly see patients in that stage where the renal function is well preserved, there is no or little proteinuria or blood pressure is hardly elevated. Uh, nephrologists tend to see patients who have already established diabetic kidney disease, glomerular filtration rate is already compromised, many of these patients have a GFR less than and these are the patients who have all the problems of hypertension, renal dysfunction and other comorbidities. So, while managing a patient of diabetic kidney disease, one should remember that the management strategy will not be the same. If you go by the guideline and also for all practical purposes, management of diabetic kidney disease primarily depends on a strict glycemic control, particularly in early diabetic kidney disease. There, the hemoglobin A1C may be directed towards less than 6.5 also, but with advancing renal failure, when the renal failure is more pronounced, then the hemoglobin A1C target may be even higher, maybe 8 or so. So once again, I reiterate that the management strategy may not be the same for early decay or advanced decay have been some sea changes in the management strategy so far as diabetic control is concerned. As I have already said, the target is changing. Similarly, the choice of drugs is also changing. In the JFR is well preserved, you have a cafeteria choice. You can have practically all sorts of anti-diabetic drugs. And there now the guidelines elevate the choice of the newer drugs like AC LT2 inhibitors to stage one, I mean, in the first uh, step. So even the, the some of the guidelines also, they elevate the other agents like GLP-1 uh, RAs also in combination with uh, AC LT2 inhibitors. But as we advanced, we, we, we go higher up in the ladder. As for example, a patient comes to a nephrologist who is not on HCL2 inhibitor and the GFR is less than 30, the recommendation doesn't say that you can start HCL2 inhibitor de novo. If the patient is on HCL2 I, you can continue with HCL2 I, but you should not add de novo or uh, at, at such a stage, you cannot introduce HCL2 inhibitor. Of the GLP-1 analogs also, there is only one that is recommended with a GFR less than 30, maybe up to 15. But most of the other GLP-1 RAs, they are not recommended at a very low GFR. <clears throat> Interestingly, two nephrologists at such a low GFR, not what is recommended in the standard uh, KDGO recommendations like uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, like uh, uh, ripaglenide, like some of the sulfonylureas, metformin is also out. So that is the situation where a nephrologist come across, comes across a patient with advanced diabetic kidney disease because 
when a patient has a well preserved gfr those patients are being managed primarily by physicians diabetologists sometimes cardiologists and they are referred to nephrologists when the gfr drops to less than 30 so this is the part of diabetic management coming to the second issue that is blood pressure control also the choice becomes slowly slowly constricted narrowed down as you go up in the ladder of uh, ckd suppose a patient who has a well preserved gfr you have lot of options and there is no question about on target trials but when the patient comes to with a, comes with a GFR of less than 30 once again the problem arises as for example the recommendation says when the GFR is more than 30 if the blood pressure is not controlled with ACI or ARBs you can add MRAs but once again MRAs most of the MRAs if you go by the recommendation they are contraindicated when the GFR is less than 30 then we have to fall back upon the conventional antihypertensives, calcium channel blockers, diuretics, centrally acting antihypertensives, beta blockers, and so on. Keeping in mind these recommendations, uh, KDGO and whatever, what has been tra transpired in, in the, this ongoing ADA? If you look carefully, I'm not discussing the individual presentations of ADA, but if you go by the trend, the trend is combination. Primarily combination of HGLT2 I and GLP1 RAs. If you go by the antihypertensive blood pressure control, also, there is a there are recommendations that you should combine with ACI or ARBs and not MRAs like phenetronone in this uh, Fidelius uh, PKD trial or uh, even uh, Essex Senator in the, the, the newly published uh, X, uh, I Essex uh, DN trial that has been very recently published, the Essex DN trial, well, Essex Senator also has been tried. So this combination of MRA with the standard ACI ARB, particularly ARB because ACI with heart failure, ARB with it is with, uh, not with the heart problem. So, if you go by the train, the train is to combine. If you combine, then once again, the problem is hyperkalemia, though the hyperkalemia problem is relatively less with this non-steroidal uh, MRAs. But it is not that they are not there. Again, the recommendation is like this. Here, the, 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 if you go by the, the, the essence of the recommendations of uh, ADA, the patient is gaining weight and ACL2 inhibitors. If the patient has uh, uh, edema, then you combine with, you go, you, you take the recommendations of sonar, then you uh, combine with endothelial receptor antagonists and ACL2 inhibitors. If the patient has got hyper the conventional MRAs, then you go with the newer MRAs like uh, this uh, and uh, the, the other ones, which are the non steroidal form of uh, MRAs. So, by and large, if you feel the pulse of ADA recommendations, it seems that they try to establish that only one drug now the GLP 1 RAs have been elevated to the step one management. So nothing is there uh, beyond step one. You cannot make them step zero. If you did, there, there was some uh, provision, I think they could, could, would have elevated the GLP, uh, this uh, SGLT2 inhibitors to, to even before step one. But now, regarding the antihypertensives also, it, 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 the, the, as if the recommendation is like this, combine SGLT2 inhibitor with everything. And it is the final bullet for every sort of management, for obesity, SGLT2-1, for inhibitor plus MRAs, for volume retention, SGLT2 inhibitors plus um, any, any other things, because SGLT2 inhibitors, they take care of the volume part. So some of the like, yeah, 
the endothelial receptor antagonists, they tend to cause volume retention, combined with ACLT3 inhibitor. So this is the trend, as if SG2 inhibitor are the final answer of everything. This is the train that, uh, that that struck me in, in, in this ADA recommendation, the ADA presentations. I think against all these presentations, there was one presentation by Dr. Mariam Afkarian. This Dr. Mariam Afkarian, she highlighted three issues. One is our experience with combination is not very good like on target. So before combining, we should think twice. This is one. Second, she has said that all these newer drugs, they are not time tested. And some of the trust as for in Sonar or even uh, Fidelius DKD, the number of patients are very small. So with this small number of studies, jump to a conclusion that this is the final answer. You have to wait. We have to give time to all these newer drugs, new combinations to have the final answer. And third, what she says is the cost, which has a significant relevance in the inhibitor or in, in any of these drugs, ACLT inhibitors now uh, some of the aclt 2 is are uh, relatively inexpensive, relatively, not that inexpensive. But if you combine it with the newer MRAs or ERAs or with uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, the cost of therapy is sky high. So while selecting these combinations, particularly in Indian scenario, in the context of practice of Indian population of patients. I think Professor Shujay Ghosh also highlighted this. As if the pharma industry is, is uh, now driving with its all might to write a CLT inhibitor with every possible combination. I think before going, before sorting to that uh, trend, one should think twice, one should give a, a sensible thought to what exactly should be the we need more time. Thank you very much.